But as soon as we got over the hump, all hell broke loose. We hear this loud rah, roar. Oh my God. And it was a German Tiger tank. And I don't know why I, I went through it, but I went through the hedgerow and on the other side, I saw a, a, the, a squad. They were all dead, 10 in a row. And then my sergeant came over to me and put his hand on my shoulder and said, a, a shell hit his juggler and he died instantly. Warning, the frontline testimony you're about to hear is, at times, extremely graphic. The realities of war are often difficult, but it's vitally important that these stories are told and the lessons are learned. Your discretion is advised. My name is Harold Zalowski, and I was in the 9th Division, 47th Regiment, Company B. I was born in, in the Bronx, New York, in 1925. When I got out of... Of, uh, of high school, my parents didn't want me to go into the, into the army, so they sent me to a, a, uh, a, an engineering school in Hoboken, New Jersey, called Stevens Institute of Technology. And uh, I went there and I was the worst student they ever had. What did your parents want to happen? They wanted me to, to uh, uh, go to officers tra OTS, Officers Training School. But uh, I didn't want to. So when I finished my year at Stevens, I was drafted. When I went into Utah Beach, the beach was cleared. So uh, we got on the beach, and but as soon as we got over the hump, all hell broke loose. The Germans shelled the hell out of us, and, and it was flat over there. So I was looking for a place to hide my head, and I remember diving into the sand and trying to trying to get low so the I would the shells wouldn't wouldn't get me. And uh, uh, I I remember uh, when I got out of the army, I went to a meeting of uh, uh, in right here in 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 in, in the. Uh, at the local Jewish place, and I met a guy who, who was also in the invasion, uh, and I said, to him, uh, what do you remember about your first day in combat? And he said, I wet my pants. I was so relieved because that was what happened to me. The first day in battle, I wet my pants. <laughs> we were shelled constantly, and we were heading towards San Lo, uh, and we were supposed to take said low, but we didn't have the resources, and, we, and we, they were they were they were killing us. So we we withdrew and we head toward. Uh, Cherbourg. Cher, thank you, Cherbourg. <laughs> and we took Cherbourg, and uh, and then we had a month later. We headed back towards San Lo. Someone once asked me, "Did you ever experience uh, um, uh, 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 what the heck is it? Did you ever experience Jew hatred, uh, anti-Semitism?" Anti Thank you. And I said, "Well, w one time I, we were." We were heading. We were with the with the, with with our group, and one of the guys said, uh, "Our lieutenant was pinned down in in the, in, the, in an open field, and and a couple of the guys said that damn Jew lieutenant is going to get us all killed." Well, that didn't make me feel too good, but uh, there was no time to make a statement. Uh, and after they said that, the the uh, medic came up and said, I need someone to help me carry a stretcher to get the lieutenant. Uh, so I volunteered for that, and I went out with the medic in the open field, and I, I, I saw he had a big red cross, and I said, oh my God, he's got a red cross on him, but I got nothing. They can pop me off. But fortunately, they didn't, and we got to the lieutenant and, 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 and got him on the stretcher and got back. He had his arm shot off. Was he conscious, the lieutenant? He, he, was, he was conscious. In fact, as I looked at his, at his uh, 
at his uh, at his badge. I, I wanted to make sure that he was Jewish, <laughs> and so I just looked at it and it did say Hebrew. He was Jewish. And when you guys went to rescue the lieutenant, were you under fire? Uh. Uh, well, well, yes, we were always on the fire. Yeah, that was part of the battle. But they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't shoot us when we uh, carried them out. Though they let us, they let us through the, with the medic. The main battle was in the hedgerows. The hedgerows were fifteen feet tall, and the big problem was the tanks could not get through the hedgerows bec because they didn't have anything to to go through the hedgerows. And so the casualties were very heavy. Usually the infantry follows the tank. But if you follow the tank, the tank, the tank couldn't go through. So we, we, we had, had to go through without the tank. And the, head, the, the casualties were horrendous. Uh, I knew that the casualties were terrible, but if you ask me, do I remember people getting killed? I don't have a recollection of that, of people getting killed. But I knew that, 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 it was, that casualties were terrible. One, one, someone came up to me and said, to me, look, soldier, don't make friends with anybody because they may not be here tomorrow. That wasn't too reassuring because the next day I made a friend of, of the, the, the BAR man. And he, his name was Zeke, and he, he kind of took me onto his wing, and and told me about life in 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 the uh, in Kentucky, in, in what do you call that land, the, the, uh, uh, where he lived. Appalachia. Yeah, and told me all about, uh, and uh, he was a nice guy. One day. The sergeant uh, said, everybody up, we're pulling out. And I started to pull out. And as I pulled out, I saw Zeke was still sleeping in the foxhole. So I said, Zeke, Zeke, get up. We're pulling out. And then my sergeant came over to me and put his hand on my shoulder and said, a, a shell hit his juggler and he died instantly. So... I said goodbye to Zeke, and they gave me his BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle, to carry until someone came in in a week or so, and I, I gave it up because it was pretty heavy. <laughs> One of the most vivid memories I had, well, when, well, I'll tell you one thing about casualties. I remember going, push, somehow going through the hedgerow and, and I don't know why I, I went through it, but I went through the hedgerow, and on the other side, I saw a, a, a squad. They were all dead, 10 in a row, mowed down by the, by the Germans. And I said, oh my God, they're all dead. And I jumped back, flew back into the, uh, the other side. And that was, my, that was my main experience of seeing GIs, dead GIs. They were frozen. Now, thank you. That's the word I knew. They were frozen. They're like, ah. And, it's, and that's when I said, oh, my God, they're all dead. Every morning, the sergeant used to assign two guys to go out on patrol. And I, I would see them looking over a map. And I said, oh, my God, I hope they don't call on me to, be, to do patrol work because I got such a poor sense of direction. Uh, uh, I know I would go in the wrong direction if so. I was, that was the one thing that I was afraid afraid of, that they would they would make me a scout to go out to the Germans. And I said I didn't want to die on the German side. If I'm going to die, I want to die with my buddies. Anyhow, this this memory, this other memory, actually hap starts. Forty years later, forty years later, I had moved from from New Jersey to Phoenix, and I had gone through all sorts of uh, emotional hell. 
but 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 in 1944, which would have been 40 years later, 19, 1984. Sorry, 1984. I was riding my pickup truck, and I was recollecting all the things that happened the morning I was wounded. And the morning I was wounded, I remember I got up, I looked down, and I and my le I looked down and I didn't see my left leg; it was gone. Then I looked again and I found my left leg was laying over my right leg. And I pushed my left leg back with my right leg and, 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 and made a temporary split together. And then I yelled, medic! And then I, the medic came, came and it, guess what? It was the same medic that I helped that time get the lieutenant. He came and then he... He took care of my wounds and gave me the, the medicine to, so I wouldn't go with, get into shock. And then he said, well, uh, I'll, I'm going to go get someone to, uh, to get a stretcher and get you out of here. And he pulls away, and as he, a minute after he pulls away, a shell comes over just where he was standing, explodes, throws dirt all over me, but I'm in a foxhole. I was, and and he, he would have been killed if he had. Anyhow... He came back, put me on a stretcher, and they're carrying me out. And as they're carrying me out, these guys are yelling, million dollar wound, a million dollar wound. I said, get my leg blown off, and I got a million dollar wound, okay. And then he, the next thing I hear is my sergeant yelling, Jalowski, you're a good soldier, you're a good soldier. And I said, what do you mean? I'm, I said to myself, what do you mean I'm a good soldier? I get my leg almost blown off and I'm a good soldier? Doesn't make any sense. And they carried me on. They took me to a field hospital. And I, at that time, I read about what happens when, you, when they amputate. You get these phantom pains. And I didn't want them to amputate my leg. So they, said, they would put a pin to my foot and said, do you feel this? And whether I felt it or not, I always said, yeah, I feel it. And so they didn't amputate my leg. And, uh, well, and I get all these different memories. And all of a sudden, I'm in the truck, and I say, oh, my God, I remember what happened the night before I was wounded. And I said, I remember saying these words, Oh, God, and I said these words. It's a good thing I did. It's a good thing I did. And I said, I'm my own man. I'm my own man. So what happened the night before I was wounded? Well, the way it worked was, I remember it was very dark. Casualties were heavy. We were all disillusioned and... and, and depressed and because uh, people were dying again I don't I don't remember seeing them die but I knew that we knew casualties were ter terrible anyhow a few minutes later I see the sergeant heading toward us and for some hurry how I see his face very clearly like like maybe the clouds parted and the moon shining on his face, and I could see his face. And I said, oh, my God, how does the sergeant go on? He's been in the, the invasion of Africa, in, in, in uh, the invasion of Italy, Sicily, and then the invasion of Normandy, and, and, he, and he still give, gives us courage. And I said to myself, I would follow him through hell and back. And I looked at his face again and I said, he looks like Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, anyhow, he comes toward us, to us and he says, I need two men to go out on patrol, but it is so dangerous I don't have the heart to make anyone go out. So I'm asking for two volunteers to go out on patrol. And all of a sudden, somehow, beyond my ken, my arm shoots up. 
I, I say my arm, I think it was my arm, but I don't know how, why my arm would shoot up. That's the, that's the one thing I was scared of doing. But it, it was up there, and it was funny the way it was, my arm was up there. It was like it wasn't my arm. Anyhow, whether it was my arm or not, I went on patrol with, this, with another guy, went through the hedgerows toward the German lines, we couldn't have gone more than 200 yards when we heard German voices. And it must have been maybe 30 seconds later, we hear this loud rah, roar. Oh my God. And it was a German Tiger tank, which was the biggest, noisiest tank the Germans had. And, it, and we said, quiet. It's like the tank is almost on top of us. And one of us said those famous words, let's get the hell out of here. And we, we ran back, like I never ran back so fast, toward, the, toward our lines, made it back toward our lines, got through. And the last thing I remember was digging my foxhole deeper and deeper so that my head was back there and my feet were sticking out. Sir, can you please take us through the actual full story of how you were wounded? The way I was wounded is that a German shell came over, hit a tree above my leg, and, and gave me a burst down on my leg, and, and I almost blew it off. The shrapnel? Oh, the shrapnel, yes. Uh, uh. So were you walking under the tree or were you sitting or I was laying in the foxhole with my with my with my head back here back in it, it, it back and my and my legs exposed so that that the tree burst hit my leg and and can you describe what was the pain like um uh, interesting uh, I don't I don't recall feeling much pain because he gave me that that uh, morphine. morphine at the time, and that and that uh, kept me from going into shock, and I didn't experience too much pain till later, and and then I started uh, uh, till I went into the hospital, and they they started doing uh, different grafts and and. Uh, uh, it was it was pretty painful. So could you uh, use your hands? Because the camera can't see the leg when you were talking about it. Could you use your hands to show how it? You know, your leg when you saw it originally was there. And okay, this is what it looked like. My left leg, my left leg was hanging over my right leg, and I and I looked down and I said, oh. There's my left leg, so I, I took my right, le my right leg and uh, lifted it up and moved my left leg almost back into place so that when the medic came, he, he, he just had to wrap it up and give me a temporary, uh, whatchamacallit, <laughs> uh, uh, tourniquet? Tourniquet, thank you. <laughs> The medic gave me a temporary tourniquet because my, my leg was, was almost back in place. Can you please describe just how much of your leg, like how was it hanging on? Just from a few tendons or was it completely cut and there was just a little bit of skin holding it? There was just a little, uh, that right. My leg was, uh, it was like it was completely gone except there was a little, a little bit hold on. Little tendons are holding it in place, and uh, and it took 22 surgeries in the hospital to put it all together, and and, uh, and I, I I usually finish my my story by telling something funny that happened in the hospital, and I, I and what happened was. Uh, after about the fourth or fifth surgery, 
I started getting depressed. And when you get depressed, you get a little honorary. And the way I got honorary was I started to complain about the food. And I, and I told the nurse who I adored, and it was the nurses were wonderful, and I told the nurse, the next big wig that comes through here, I'm going to tell them how lousy the food is here. And my nurse kind of smiled, said, oh, Jalowski, you're full of it. You're not going to tell them anything. I said, you just wait and see. Anyhow, a few days later, the nurse walks in with a big smile on her face, and I say, what? And she says, Jalowski, you're going to get your wish. And I say, what? Again. And she says, next week, General Dwight D. Eisenhower is making the rounds of this hospital. And I said, oh, my God, what have I got myself into? Anyhow, I said to the nurse, I don't care. I'll tell him how lousy the food is. So anyhow, the way it works out is the day of that, that, they, that they, they make rounds, they, 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 uh, all the, they only uh, see the soldiers who are post-up. And as luck or whatever would have it, I was post-up, and they put us in a special ward. Day comes, I'm in that special ward, and in walks General Dwight D. Eisenhower. That's Schaaf. Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force with all those cocktails. And I'm, he's in the, he, I'm in the, he, he starts in the front and I'm in the back. And I, he shakes hands with the guys in the front and as he comes, comes towards me, I say, oh my God, my heart starts to beat. I said, I don't know if I can do this. Uh, I said, oh, well, I'll do my best. And he comes toward me and he gets to me, and he shakes my hand, and he says, what outfit you with, soldier? I was told him, 9th Division, 47th Regiment, Company B, sir. And he said, 9th Division? That is the outfit that I went into Africa with. And would you believe it? I got a, an almost... It was almost 10 minutes he gave me a, a story of the invasion of Africa from President Dwight D. Eisenhower. I, I, was, I was enthralled with the story. And, uh, and then, he, then, then Eisenhower talks about the invasion of Sicily, then the invasion of Italy. And finally, he gets to the invasion of Normandy, and he stops. And I say, here's my chance. I'm just about to say something when he says, the food good here, soldier? And I said, yes, sir. And that's how I told off General Dwight D. Eisenhower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you for sharing uh, that. Could you please tell us about some of the other wounded that you recall when you were in the hospital? What were some of the injuries that stick out in your mind? Pretty bad. Most of them was we or uh, ileostomy or what do they call them? Uh, when you can't urinate or colostomies. That was that was that was very common. I remember the guy next to me was was a marine, and he had uh, he had he had a colostomy, uh, and he would look at at my wound, and he said. Because it was a big gaping wound, he said. He said, "I remember him saying, oh my God, I'm glad I don't have that.' <laughs> I'm thinking, he's glad he don't have that. I'm glad I don't have what you have." <laughs> Could you describe what it was like to be under a German artillery bombardment? I mean, really, put me in your shoes. What you see, what you feel, what it you know looks like. <sighs> Can you please describe being under German artillery? Well, my, the, 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 the only vivid memory I had was the, fir was the first shelling. And when the shells came over, uh, I would, uh, I, the ground w wasn't hilly enough. So I would scrape the ground 
and try to try to get get my get a little lower, so that I so that the shell hopefully the shell would would go over my head, not into me. And that's the that's the main thing is to is to keep low. Okay. When I saw guys who, 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 when the shelling started, they, they, they were standing up. I said, hey, what are you standing up for? And I, I have a picture there on the wall there of, of me. I'm, I'm the guy bent over this way because I remember I always lowered my head. So... I, I, the chances are I, my, my, not, my might not get shot, which I fortunately didn't. Can you please tell us a little more about Zeke? I wanted you to mention that he's a, he was an older man, and didn't he sometimes not even wear his helmet, right? He, he was an older guy. He was about 38 years old, uh, uh, old enough to be my father told us about life in, in, the, in the hillbilly country of Kentucky. Uh, uh, and he was very cavalier about, he said, if you're going to die, you're going to die. I, uh, I, I never took that attitude. I, uh, I, said, uh, uh, I said, Zeke, you've you, you got to lower your head a little bit. Uh, but anyhow, he... he he was a sweet guy, took me under his wing. Uh, I hated to see him go. I went back to Normandy with my grandchildren of, you know, for the 75th, but I, and I went through all the graves, but I couldn't find his. Do you remember his last name? I, I didn't remember, but I looked for Zeke, 47th Regiment, and I could not find it. Do you think Zeke was a nickname? Uh, I don't know, but that's what I, the only name I remember. Can you finish the story? Those two guys who were uh, anti-Semitic, yeah. didn't you see them later? <laughs> As a matter of fact... When I was in the hospital, I, I saw them in, in the hospital that I, uh, that I was in, in Massachusetts. Devin, Devin, uh, Fort Devon. Fort Devon, in the air of Massachusetts. And I saw them. And guess what? They were still cussing out the Jews. <laughs> and, and why were they in the hospital? Were they wounded? Or? Uh, well... If they were, it wasn't much of a wound. Could you please tell us about the living conditions in combat? The living conditions in the hospital? In combat. On the front lines. Oh! Uh, I, I never thought of living conditions, just surviving. Just well, I mean, explain, if you don't mind, where would you sleep, what would you eat, that kind of thing. I guess they call them D rations or B rations or something, and uh, uh, food was good. I, I, uh, I, uh, uh, but uh, something we never, never really thought about. The, the basic thing was to survive. Could you please tell us about your communication? Did you get a write letters home when you were overseas? Or? Yes, I, I did write letters because I remember reading uh, something that was written in my local newspaper. That, and the article was that the Army notified the my parents that I was wounded, but my, but I but I found out later I guess that, that my parents knew about it before then because I had written that I had to them that I had been wounded, but but I was still alive. Could you 
please tell us about any patrols that you went on besides the one where you the day before you were wounded were, were there any other patrols well uh, I guess at one day uh, it was that there was a uh, what do you call it all quiet on the western front uh, the, which means that the, that the, there was a temporary uh, 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 Ceasefire, temporary ceasefire, and and the sergeant told me uh, uh, to uh, uh, guard these German prisoners. So I and I and I and I, and I and I went over to where the German prisoners were sitting around, and and uh, and they were standing up, and I thought, what are they still? Let them even stand there. They, they could they, they could they could take a pot shot at me or something or, or rush me. I said so I said to them in German, Zetzen Sie sich if they knew a little German, sit down. And they were only too glad to sit down. And they sat down and they were smiling and laughing and so happy to be alive that I had I had a, I had to feel good about the I had to feel good about their being alive and their, their being happy. And, and it was over for them. And, and whatever they were told about what the Americans might do to them, they saw that it wasn't true. They were treated royally. Um, could you please tell me about any souvenirs that you picked up? <laughs> souvenirs. I picked up a German camera. Uh, I picked up a German scabbard. Uh, I think those are the two things I remember: camera and a scabbard. And uh, uh, and those I took home with me. Uh, I don't know what happened to the scabbard, but I remember I was not a big collector of uh, of cameras. And I met someone that that that, that loved c cameras, so I said, "Here, take it." And I gave it away to somebody who was thrilled to have a German camera. And I think I took some pictures with it. Could you please tell us about? Your readjustment to civilian life after the war, did you have any difficulties, you know, nightmares or anything? No, I, I did not. Uh, you have to remember that in those days, if everybody knew they, there was a war going on. Everyone knew that they had to do something to serve their country. So there was nothing special, really, about being wounded or anything. I, fact is, I, uh, uh, my, my, one of my best friends, I didn't learn that he was wounded or, or until I, many, many years later, when he told us, we were talking about uh, war experiences. And he sa I said to him, Seymour, how come, uh, how come you never told me about that? He said, what's to tell? Everybody, everybody was in the army. Everybody got the chance was getting wounded. It was no big deal. So I, didn't, I never talked about it. Have you had long-lasting effects from your leg injury? Not severely. I, 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 I play tennis. Could you please tell us the story of seeing your family for the very first time after you came home? Yeah, I, I used to have a couple of pictures of that. I don't know what happened. Of them visiting me in the ward, uh, with my brother and my mother, and uh, um, maybe my father was there too. And, uh, and they visited me. Do you remember that first visit, though? That must have meant so much. Oh, yes, it did. I remember when I was wounded, my brother wanted to volunteer for overseas duty, but, but he got over that. <laughs> he didn't make it overseas. But uh, here's a funny story. 
Let me give you. When I was uh, finished with the hospital, my brother said, you want to go skiing? So I said, sure. And my, my brother took me skiing in upstate New York. And uh, I got on the skis, went down the slope and fell. And guess what? I broke my good leg. <laughs> so, I had a, so I was in a plastic cast for another six weeks. But, but that was okay. It was kind of funny. Uh, my parents would send me lots of great food, salamis and rye bread and uh, Jewish food and stuff. And I would go on furlough once in a while. One time I went on furlough and my leg started to get came inflamed. I had to go rush me back to the, to the, to the hospital because, because the shrap, there was the shrapnel in my leg that was infecting it, and so they had to do, run, run me into the operating room get, uh, to, to take out that shrapnel. But they got it out. Can you please tell us, Mr. Jalowski, what life advice do you want to give to future generations? I would tell them that expression I heard from someone when I did volunteer work in a, uh, in a hospital for Alzheimer people. And he had a shirt. And on the shirt it was written, the price of freedom is not free. And, and he, he wasn't talking to anybody, but he came in one day and I looked at this shirt and I said out loud to him, the price of freedom is not free. And he points to his shirt and he said, that's true. The price of freedom is not free. I think we all have to know that we have to pay a price to maintain our freedom. It may be that you get wounded, it may be that you die. But in order to maintain your freedom, you have to be prepared to make the supreme sacrifice.